And sometimes a basketball team, when they're winning, can go on coast mode, and the team that's behind can very easily overshadow them and take over the victory. Sometimes a coach, during that halftime, has to call out individuals. Sometimes they have to say, this is not working. They have to redesign a play, and they have to really revamp everything that was going on in the first half. So you all know that my team lost. Yeah, well, so I want to say this, something that KU fans can't say is we have Wildcat football coming on. And because KU doesn't have a football team, or I guess they do, but you just never see them. They don't go to bowls or anything. So, um, uh, so I have, I have my, one of my friends here, uh, Hunter is the backup quarterback for K-State. Hunter, stand up again. I'm supporting his jersey that his mom and dad bought for me, but I can't preach in this jersey because it's, it's the, I, I lost a bet. And I got to preach in front of you humiliated today. <laughs> Embarrassed. Because I've got to take this off and wear this. <laughs> and I don't like this. So if it's a bad sermon, it's about this. It's not about what I did. It's about I shouldn't have been betting. Okay, preacher shouldn't bet, right? So, but I lost a bet. And sometimes when you lose a bet, you've got to pay the price. And I'm absolutely paying the price. <laughs> sometimes in the middle of life, there's a pause. And in that pause, you have to reevaluate what you're doing. And that's halftime. In every situation, whether it's the middle of our life or whether it's a relationship or what's going on, whether you're 15 years old, 10 years old, or 50 years old, there's a time in your life where you have to make a pause and you have to understand, is this what I am supposed to do? And sometimes there needs to be a coach, and that coach is Jesus, that will come alongside you and say, there has to be some changes made. If you continue doing what you have always done, you will always fail and sometimes we get overconfident and we think everything's wonderful and everything's great. And in reality, that overconfidence can come back and bite you because overconfidence is a sin. But what we must do is we must rely on Christ. And at this half time of your life, it's kind of like you went to a movie and you came to the movie about 30 minutes late and you had no idea what the first 30 minutes is all about and you start watching the movie and by the end of the movie you start understanding the plot but then the movie is over what we want to do is we want to evaluate and we want to make some changes in your life and in my life at the halftime of our life or at a time a time out in our life that we can make adjustments now I've had many coaches in my life I've had coaches that scream and yell anybody can relate to that all they did is scream and yell, and you're afraid of them because they get mad, they're just going to take you out of the game, and, and it's just, uh, you just don't want to play for them. And then you have these other coaches that are intellectual, that talk to you, that work with you. Jim Naismith said this. He said, you find your sweet spot. Phil said sweet spot. You find your sweet spot on the court. And you work on that sweet spot, wherever your shot is, that you can make 80%, 70% of those shots, you find where your sweet spot is on the court. My job as the coach is to develop the play to get you to shoot at your sweet spot. And in our life, what we have to, we have to understand, what am I created to do? What am I called to do? And I need to work on what I am called to do. And Jesus, the coach, the church, is supposed to develop a play so you can shoot at your sweet spot so you can have victories. But so often, we want to shoot a three-pointer. We want to be victorious. We want everybody to think we're the greatest player in the world. And Jesus didn't call us all to be the greatest players in the world. He called us to find our sweet spot. And to shoot the ball, shoot our life, use our influence where we are best motivated to do. And that's our sweet spot. What is your sweet spot in life? Maybe we're shooting at the spot that we cannot make. Maybe we're trying to be the hero, and God didn't call us to be the hero. What God has called us to do is to evaluate. Evaluate what we can do. 
when we do that, God can teach us some things. And I want to talk to you about a few things that God has taught me over a half time of my life. Over certain things as the pastor and as your, as your uh, leader, if you would say that, as the coach. There's times in our life that this is a time out or this is a half time. And there's things that we have to evaluate. It may not be the same thing that I have to evaluate in my life, but I believe the principles are there. And the first one is vision. Develop the ability to look behind the majority. Sometimes there's always going to be people that say you can't or you shouldn't do that or that's not right. And many people will tell you that you can't do certain things, but if God has called you to do certain things, nobody should ever tell you you can't. God has called you and has motivated you to do something great. Develop the ability to worry about God, not worry about others. Develop the ability that somebody can say no to you, but that doesn't mean God is saying no for you. The ability to see, vision, inspiration, the ability to look at what God has in store for you and say, you have to develop something in my life that I can do. It's the sweet spot within our life. It's the vision. It's the purpose that God has created us for. And vision is very important. Vision is seen above, beyond the naysayers. I was at this conference a few weeks ago, and they, uh, it called, they used to be called the Eustas. Anybody know what a Eusta is? We have a lot of Eustas here. They used to go to church here. Uh, and they get upset over certain things. And there's a lot of times within my life that those, those Eustas hurt me. I was worried about what they were thinking. I was worried about what they did. I was scared about why they left the church. And it hurt. And it got to the point where I had to say, I am not here to please them. I'm here to please God. And as long as I please God, as long as I preach his word, as long as we do what God wants to do, we have to see past the naysayers. We have to see past the people that do not like something that you do or the philosophy of the church or the music of the church or the direction of the church. There's plenty of churches my job and your job is to be the best church member, the best pastor that God has called us to be. And next Sunday is going to be a great opportunity for that. See, we have to have a vision that next week on Easter Sunday morning is bigger than any other Sunday of the year. So what about you? We ask you to visit. We ask you to pass out uh, flyers about Easter Sunday morning and Good Friday. We're doing that this afternoon. But I want you to do something. I need you to do something. Next Sunday morning, on Easter Sunday morning, there's going to be a lot of uh, CEO Christians here. You know what CEO Christians are? Christmas, Easter, and other activities. <laughs> Weddings and funerals. They go to church there and those things. But we can't hurt them. What we must do is minister to them. What we must do is when they walk in these doors, we have an opportunity for them. That opportunity is to share the message of Jesus Christ. And what we're going to do is we ask you to come early. We ask you to meet them. We're asking you to minister to them and shake their hand and talk to them and get to know them. Because that is an opportunity, the greatest opportunity the church has is to share people about Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to do next Sunday morning. And I'm asking you to have a vision. To have a vision that something that has not happened yet but can happen. And we do not listen to the naysayers. We listen to what God wants us to do. And what we must do is preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that are hurting and dying. A vision. Have a purpose. Develop the ability to see beyond the naysayers. Have a vision. The second thing is believe God in spite of the circumstances. And this is faith. In spite of the circumstances, believe that God can use you. In Matthew chapter 21, 22, it says, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. We have to pray that God can work us out through any circumstances that we're in. Even when we're behind in the game, even when we feel like there's no hope, I love the last five minutes of every basketball game. You don't even need to watch the first 15 minutes, do you? It's the last five minutes of the game. That last five minutes is impression. And March Madness has been crazy for close games. Been crazy. And tonight's not going to be close, but 
everything else was close there in the, these games. And you can watch the last five minutes of the game, and it, it causes tension. But what we have to do is we have to understand that through prayer and supplication, God can work things out. And what we must do in our life is we must end well. We can't put it on coast mode. We can't say, well, I hope it works out. We have to start strong, and we have to understand the plan. We have to understand the game plan. We have to talk to the coach. And when the coach tells us what we should do, we should not say, you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do. If the coach would say, I need you to shoot a layup and not a three-pointer, but you go out and you keep on shooting three-pointers, guess what that coach is going to do? You're out of there. If you can't follow the game plan, you're not playing in the game. And so often, God has asked us to do certain things, but we say, no, coach, I don't care what you tell me to do. I'm going to do what I tell you to do. And guess what? At halftime, he very may easily say, take off the uniform. Go sit in the crowd. You're not playing in my game. And sometimes we do what we want to do, and we don't do what the coach or God wants us to do. And sometimes he just says, you know, I just sat on the sideline. If you're not going to do what I ask you to do, I can't bless you in what you're doing because what you're doing is not what I asked you to do. Everything is possible for him who believes and he who does. Jesus in Mark chapter 11 says this. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whatever you say to this mountain, and it will be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt it, his heart, but believes that things that he has says, he will be done, and he will be done whatever he asks. We can ask God for anything, and God can deliver the goods for us, but we have to have faith that God is in control, but we have to do what he's called us to do. And then the third one is ask for wisdom. Not intelligence, but wisdom. Wisdom. Sometimes we are just not very wise. Sometimes in our halftime, we have to just say, Lord, give me wisdom on how to handle certain things. Not intelligence, not know how to do it, but be wise in how I do it. In parenting, sometimes we have to be wise, and sometimes in parenting, we're not very wise. Sometimes we say the wrong thing and do the wrong thing and act the wrong way, and sometimes we just have to say, Lord, give me wisdom in what I'm doing. And sometimes we have to have wisdom in our communication, wisdom in our life, and wisdom is just saying, Lord, I need your wisdom. And in James chapter 1, verse 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God of it, who gives all liberally and without reproach, and will be given to him wisdom. Have you ever just not known what to do? You're in a situation and you just, I don't know. I, it's over my head. Maybe you're 20 points down at halftime and you, the team is faster, stronger, and better than you. And you're saying, what do I do? And you go to the Lord on your knees and say, Lord, what should I do? And he gives to you inspiration, motivation, and vision. And he says, here's the game plan. And here's what John Maxwell says. Small wins. Small wins. Don't try to win the game instantaneously. But try to have small wins. Try to have an ability to win the game in increments. Try to make sure that first that you can run the ball. Second, that you can shoot the ball. Make sure that everything is in its place. Ask God for wisdom. And here's uh, what we need to do is learn from the past, but don't live in it. That's experience. Sometimes the first half is something that we say, well, we can't do that. They're too big underneath or they're too fast out front. And sometimes we just can't do certain things. So we have to learn from our experience of what we have done and try not to repeat the same experience. But so often... Because we have repeated our experiences of our past, we live the same way into the future, and the timeout is no good for us because we could care less what the coach asks. So we live in the past, and the past is biting us. It's killing us. We all have setbacks. We fail. There comes a time when we must move on with our life. And so often what we do when we have failed in our life, we live in the failure. We live in the past and we can't say, Lord, I need you to change me. We can't forgive ourselves. And when we can't forgive ourselves, we live in the past and we live in this deja vu. And all we do is sit on the sideline. We hang our heads low and we say the game is over. 
I'm going to be pitiful in my life. And God says, quit living in the past. Get up, change the mindset, change the game plan. It's halftime. You can do better than what you've done in the past if you focus on me into the future. Today could be that day. Today could be where you move on beyond the failures. As parents, as husbands, as wives, as students, and say, you know what? I want to finish well. Maybe you're in college, you're in, you're in high school, and you're struggling in certain areas of your life. And that halftime can be for anybody at any phase of their life. There comes a time where you have to say, Lord, I need you. Don't live in the past, but learn from it. The last mistake, the last failure, the last fumble, the last missed shot. Michael Jordan said this, I have a very short memory. I could throw an interception. I could miss the shot. I could have a turnover. But I can't focus on the last turnover. What I have to focus on, what I'm going to do tomorrow. What I'm going to do in the next shot. And sometimes we are so captivated by the fear of our past that we just don't try in the future. And let me tell you something. Just like this video, the future is strong. How do we go into the future? If we go into the future with a deflated mindset, we are going to be defeated. But when we go into the future, say, Lord's on my side. He died on the cross for my sins. He loves me, and I know where my eternal destination is. We're going to be okay. I had, we had two funerals this week, one in Newton and one here in Wichita. And when I went, both of these individuals were believers. And both individuals that we had these funerals for, we got to say that we know that there's going to be a reunion. But so often, we forget the final destination. And we think that the game that we're playing right now is the only game of life. And we have to remember, the game of life that we're playing right now is for a purpose. And that purpose is the final destination. And that final destination is Jesus Christ. So at halftime, we have to say this, am I living my life pleasing to God so I can link other people to the final destination? Once you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your final de destination is secure. Now, we may not have everything that we want. We may, we may try to gain certain things, but God doesn't really care about the things that you gain unless the gain that you have is the influence that you have other people in talking to them about Christ. That is the influence that God wants us to have. The fifth thing is be committed for the long haul. And that's determination. Determination. You can tell a player that's not motivated. And when I was playing basketball, if you didn't run, you were sitting on the bench. Anybody play basketball? Your coach said, if you walk up the court, sit on the bench. Somebody else wants to play. Somebody else wants to be determined. And if we're not determined in our Christian faith, if we say, you know what, I know I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I don't care what anybody else thinks or what anybody else does, I don't care to talk to anybody else, that determination, that motivation, we are the child of God. We are the church that God has saved. Our job as a church is to be determined not to set sour and soap, but to evaluate and get other people into the family of God. We must do that. The determination. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid a hold of me. I press on. I am motivated. And the church today, I love the church. Jesus died for the church. And I pastored it. I've been pastor here for almost 20 years, and I love this church. But can I be honest with you as the coach? Sometimes we're very lethargic as the church lethargic we play we come to church we sing songs but folks if the church is going to be the church it needs to be we cannot be lethargic we have to be determined what does that look like individually what does that look like for your life and for my life that means I'm going to live my Christian faith I'm going to talk to others about what Christ has done for me I cannot be lethargic. I cannot just go along with the crowd. I have to be determined. What does that look like in basketball sense? March Madness. That means you have to have a killer instinct. That means you can't be mean and you can't be dogmatic. What that does mean is I cannot allow 
other people to deter what Christ has called me to do. And Christ has called us to be a light in a dark world. He wants you to be that player. Um, Houston, okay? I hate Houston, but, you know, Houston has a basketball player by the name of Mr. Gray. Anybody watched him? He had this little man bun on top of his head. and He was like crazy fast. And he could score at any point. And as soon as Gray got the ball, you knew he was going to the basket. And Houston really wasn't that good except for Gray. And when he took over the game, he dominated the game. And I believe when we walk into a room, what we must dominate is Jesus. We must allow Jesus to be proclaimed. We must talk and we must live. They must see what God has done within our life. I love what they said in Antioch, that they, these disciples, they perceived in their hearts that they were ignorant and unlearned, but they have been with Jesus. How we talk, how we act, what we communicate about is so important. The church, we can't be lethargic. As your coach, I have to say, we have to get up. We have to get into the game. We can't just sit and listen, sing, raise our hands and do our palm branches. We must do something bigger than that, more important than that. What we're doing this afternoon is going into neighborhoods in a mile and a half radius of this church. And we're inviting thousands of people to church for next Sunday. Thousands of people. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to impact South Wichita. I'm going to be, I've watched this news the last couple of weeks. I, I honestly, and I, I pray that this happens. I believe South Wichita is in store for an economic boom. I believe what's coming into South Wichita is going to be a very beneficial to this church and to this community. And I'm excited about what's going to take place in South Wichita over the next few years. And we are poised for great growth Great ministry. We're poised so God can bless us with an economic future and people coming into the body. But what we must do is, let me say this, if we are not who God wants us to be now, we're not going to be who God wants us to be then. What we have to be is we have to be prepared today for the game tomorrow. And I love these coaches that they give this the beginning game speech. And they say, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And he motivates everybody. They all charge out to the field. They're ready to have victory. But you know what? If they didn't prepare at practice, if they didn't learn the plays, if they didn't learn how to shoot, they could charge that field all day long. And it would all be everybody cheering. But you know what? Once they start losing five, six, seven, eight, nine games, the crowd doesn't show up. You look at the stands and it's empty. Why is that? It's because the team is not doing what the game plan said and people do not want to come to watch a losing team. And folks, that's our church. What we must do is we must prepare today to preach the gospel, to sing the songs, to teach the Bible, and to minister to people in a way that people desire to come. That God impacts us. God motivates us. We have to be determined. And then, this is the fun part. Enjoy the ride. The future is bright. We have to have contentment. We have to be determined. But you know, when the bottom line is when we leave, it's not the negative aspect, it's the positive aspect. Wow. God really taught me something today. God changed something within my life and I got a hold of God and I'm content in what God is doing within my life. In Hebrews chapter 13 it says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor will I ever forsake you. And we have to be content in that. Does mean we can't be determined. Doesn't mean that we have to be focused. It doesn't mean that we can't have vision. What it does mean is, is I am playing the game because the coach has called me into the game. And I don't have to worry about being set on the bench because I miss a shot, because we all miss shots. What I can do is I can be content knowing the coach wants me on the team. And Jesus wanted you on the team. He called you into his family. He called you into this church. So Jesus wants us to have contentment. But if you understand all those things, I want to boil it down to certain things, four things that God wants you to do with your life. This is each and every one of us. Four things that he wants you to do before you get into the game of life. 
Four things he wants you to do before you make a change in your life. Self-help books, they're good to read. But self-help books in the word of God is exactly what changes people's lives. And God has given to us a self-help book called the Bible. And um, there's four things that I think you need to know. First is you need to get to know God. Not just an acquaintance. Not somebody that you listen about on Sunday morning. But in order to have a change in your life, you have to know God as a friend. You have to pray with him and you have to learn what he has to say. And so often, sometimes, we go to church on Sunday morning and that's the only time that we even open our Bible. That's the only time we even pray is on Sunday morning when the pastor or, or somebody is praying or reading the Bible. You're not getting to know God. You're just coming to church. And as a coach, I would say this. If you do not practice, you cannot win. If you do not practice your shots, you will not win. If you do not do what God has called you to do, you cannot be victorious. What will happen in that moment is you'll shrink from fear. But God says you don't have to have fear. You have to have honor. So when we get to know God, we have to communicate to him. Communication is simply just talking to him. Um, I went to this um, uh, security conference yesterday. And they did something that was very neat. They talked about how to pray. And as security guards, as sheep dogs is what they call them, they're watching over the sheep to make sure the sheep, in the, and we're all, the Bible calls us sheep, right? So we're sheep, and there's sheep dogs, which means they are there to protect the sheep. And there are security guards all over this church. Uh, and most of them are packing, just letting you know. So if somebody comes in here, you're safe. But the idea of the prayer is this. The sheepdogs, when everybody bows their head and prays, the sheepdogs pray with their eyes open. They always are watching. They're always focused. And they're always a looking around what could take place. And they deter any failure within the body of Christ. And folks, I believe with compassion we have to pray with our eyes wide open and saying, God, I need to know you. And you don't have to have your eyes shut. And you don't have to bow your knee before the bed. And you can pray with your driving down the road with your eyes open. Please do. And then you can, you can pray instantaneously. Let me tell you something. When sin, when sin, when temptation is in front of your eyes, that's when you pray. You know, it's easy to pray at night when there's no temptation. But when you're in the face of temptation, the child of God must be able to say, Lord, I need your help now. I need you to deliver me now. And you know what God says? If you pray, you will be delivered from those temptations. Be aware of every situation that comes in front of your face. And then become like Christ. Christ followers. Christ imitators. There's no way that you're going to know what Christ is until you know what Christ did. And there's no way you're going to know what Christ did unless you get into the Word and try to be followers or imitators of Christ. Become like Christ. Develop a Christ-like character. And I love the old bumpers there. What would, Christ, what would Jesus do? I think it's a good thing. What would Jesus do? In our mindset, we need to develop a mindset of godliness. How we communicate, what we say, how we act, when we do that, Christ can do things within our life. The Bible says that everything happens in your life of a believer to bring glory to God. That means God sometimes allows pain to bring glory to God. Let's look at one of the greatest men of the Bible. His name's Paul. He was in so many prisons. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was dishonored many, many, many times. But you know what he said? I count everything as gain. I don't feel like I have lost anything. You know what Paul could have done? He could have said, I've tried this Christianity thing and it put me in a pit. It put me in prison. I was beaten. I was stoned. I was shipwrecked. I'm sick and tired of this Christianity thing. But he knew he had a purpose within his life. And sometimes as soon as something happens to us as a child of God, I'm done. And God says, everything that he does within your life is to bring glory 
and honor to him. When we bring glory and honor to him, he understands that he can serve with you and you can serve him. That brings the third point. Practice serving. We're going to spend an eternity serving. And this is just a practice. We're going to spend eternity worshiping. This is just practice. God called each and every one of us to serve the body of Christ because you're going to spend eternity serving Jesus in the body of Christ. We have all have gifts that God has gifted us in, and we must serve. There's not a person, okay, this is when there's going to be some Eustas here. There's not a person in this church that should not serve. Two amens? There should not be a person in this church that does not serve. We are here as the body of Christ to serve each other in your gifts, in your abilities. I'm not asking you to serve where you are not gifted in, but what you're called to do is be part of the body of Christ and to serve one another. When we serve, it brings glory and honor to God. When we set sour and soak, we get mad. But when we have an invested purpose within the body of Christ, when we serve, I have a job to do. And I said this a couple minutes ago, or a couple months ago. This is not my church. This is your church. You're called to be part of the body of Christ. Well, that's the pastor's job. No, it's not. You know what my job is? The Bible says I have a purpose. My job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. My job is to motivate you. If you say, well, the pastor can do it or the staff can do it. Our job as the elders and the bishops and the pastor of this church is to equip the saints. That's some of you, not all of you. It's not Josh, but most of you. <laughs> We're the saints of God. Our job is to motivate, to train, to equip, to give purpose and to serve. When we serve, we have an invested purpose. When you invite your people to church next Sunday morning and you have two or three individuals that you invested in, you talked to, you invited, and they come to church and they're sitting with you or you see them across the church and you know that you invited them, there's a couple of investments there. You're praying that the music's not too long. You're praying that the drama isn't bad. You're praying that the preacher doesn't preach on tithing. Okay? You're praying that it's a good service. Why? It's because you're invested. If you're invested, you have purpose. When you're invested, you say, I pray that Bruce talks about something that's going to impact their life. I pray the Holy Spirit of God touches their life. Because you have a purpose, because you're invested, because you're serving, when you do that, it changes what God wants within our life. And the last thing is share life's purpose with other people. The end of our life at our halftime we win that last shot, last second shot, we shoot and it goes in and the crowd go crazy. The team comes up and puts you on the shoulders and you have won the game. You've shared well, your abilities for Christ. And sometimes we must share the purpose. And do you know what your purpose is? As saints of God, our purpose is to tell others about Christ. Our purpose is to redeem the world from their lost sin. See, that's exactly what Jesus did. God saw this sin-filled world and they were broken and there was no relationship between God and man. And Jesus said this, I want to have a relationship with them, with you. I want to have intimacy, communication with humanity and he said Jesus I love you but I'm giving you a purpose and that purpose that I'm giving to you is I'm going to put you in a baby and I'm going to have you come down to this world and you're going to be beaten scourged mocked and humiliated and you're going to die but because your blood is innocent blood Sinless blood. Those that believe in you will have a relationship with me. And anybody that believes in you will go to heaven. That's the plan that God has given to us. 
And once you've accepted that plan that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, your eternal destination is secure, but your job is not done. The job that you have is to share the purpose that God has put within your life. And that purpose is that simple plan. It's all about Jesus. John says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It doesn't go to the Father because you're part of the church. It doesn't go to the Father because you go to com uh, confession or go into a communion. The only way you're going to heaven is bow your knees before God and say, Lord, I accept the blood of salvation and I accept the forgiveness that you've given to me. And I want that restoration that you, that you have given to me between God and man. That's our purpose. Set in church? Okay. Sing some songs? Okay. You want to put a smile on Jesus' face? Do your purpose. Church, our purpose is to impact the world, not enjoy church. I want you to enjoy church. I don't want you to come to church. I want you to come to, on time to church. But more importantly than coming to church on time and to coming to church at all is to be that Christ-like follower that has a passion and love for Jesus. So at the halftime of your life, your life could be in chaos and you could be down 20 points and you need the coach of Jesus Christ to come alongside you and to give you a game plan to say what you're doing is not working. You may be in the midst of sin and you're saying, Lord, I need your help. You may be facing temptation that we can't even comprehend and it's halftime. And if you don't make some game adjustments, it's not going to end well. That buzzer is going to go off and you're going to lose the game. And it's halftime. You have a determination to say, either I am going to make the changes I need to make in my life, or I'm not going to end well. What do we do? We have to make a purpose. We can put the facade, and we can put the game face on, and we can act like everything, and we can run out to that game field, and we can say, yeah, everything's going to be great, and we do the same thing that we did in the first half, and we're going to lose miserably. Or you can listen to the coach and say, it's going to be hard. Everything that we practiced for the last two weeks, we're not going to do anymore. We're going to switch from man to zone. We're going to do things that we haven't done in order to have victory. And we as the players have to follow the coach's example. Sometimes we are in defeat and we need to ask God to help us out. But there are another group of people. There's another group of people that's ahead by 15 points at halftime. And they come in they sit back and they say, everything is awesome. We are going to dominate this team. So they go out after halftime with a cocky attitude, with everything is wonderful. And they go out and they start playing around. And what happens, and you've seen it many times, they play not to lose. And what happens? The other team has determination. The other team has purpose. The other team has focus. And the other team slowly creeps up and ties the game with 30 seconds left to go in the game. And now you're stressed out. Now, oh man, my school, my coach, you're going to mad at me because we were ahead by 15 points. And all of a sudden, we are tied. And they have the ball. And they wait for that last second shot. They know that you're a better team. They know, they know that you have victory nine times out of 10. But today, we have the ball for the last shot. And they take that last shot and it goes in. The buzzer sounds off and the game is over. And the team that should have been victorious falls on their face in shame because they played not to lose. And Christians, the church, we are playing not to lose. We need to play to win. The church in the United States of America we need to play to win. There are churches, denominations, sects, and cults that are playing to win the game. And they're overpowering the Christian faith. Because we, we are confident. We think everything's wonderful. We think Jesus is going to come back and we're all going to go to heaven. And that is true. But we have people that we love that we need to bring to heaven with us.
So this halftime, what is it that you need to change in your life, in my life, that's going to get us a game plan to win in the future? And church, I'm asking you to do this. Quit being overconfident. Quit thinking everything's going to be great because Jesus is going to come back. We have a purpose. And we have a job to do. And I want you to think about this one word. It's called sphere. You have a sphere of influence that nobody else has. You know people in your line of work at your school that I would never be able to meet. That if I invited them to church, they'd laugh at me. But they love you. And you have a sphere of influence that only you have. And because of your life and because of your determination, our job is to take what God has given to us, the influence that God has given to us, and use our purpose. And I know some of us think our purpose in life is to make money. It's not the purpose of life. The purpose of life is to share the blessed name of Jesus Christ as many people as we can and to take those people to heaven with us because it's life changing. It's radical. It's taking a shot that God wants you to make. And sometimes it's fearful to take that shot. You may get rejected. You may get blocked. But that shot is important because God says, your job is to find your sweet spot in life. My job as the coach is to bring people around, the player around, so you have the ball in your hand. A divine second of time that God has orchestrated that person that he wants you to invite into the opportunity for you. And you have that divine second. Are you going to take the shot? Or are you going to walk away? Many times I've walked away. Many times I was afraid that I'd be rejected. I was afraid they'd make fun of me. I was afraid of rejection. And Jesus saying, they're not rejecting you. You're just doing what I ask you to do. They're rejecting me. And you have to obey me. My job is to develop the play. Your job is to make the shot. Do you have somebody the week before Easter, the week before Good Friday, I'm asking each and every one of us to pray for someone that you can give purpose to in life and invite them to church. Not, you don't have to preach to them. You just have to invite them. If, you, if that opportunity comes and you can share your faith, share your faith for goodness sakes. But if you just want to take the shot and invite, let them come to church and let them hear the message of Jesus Christ that can transform their life, transform their marriage, transform their kids. Before you talk to them, talk to him. Talk to him and say, Lord, give me an opportunity to invite Mike, invite Steve, invite people to the cause of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, God can do great things within your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you and we thank you. We thank you for your life. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for purpose. But Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to change. To change our heart. To change our life. And Lord, once you've changed our life, you've given to us purpose. You gave to us an opportunity for us to share the message of Jesus Christ through an invite, through an opportunity to share the faith that you've called us. So Lord, be with us today as we pray about people that need a relationship, that maybe need a second chance. Maybe they've been a church member and they just got burned out and they quit. And they have a story to tell and they want and they need you. Let us give that opportunity to them to be the church that God wants them to be. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to pray. Um, pray for someone. You all know the person that you need to pray for. You know the person that God has put into your life that needs you. They may not want you, but they need you. And until you pray to God about them, they're never going to open their eyes and they're never going to see. We have a purpose and that purpose is to share the blessed name of Jesus Christ. And there's not a greater time than now. This is Easter week. 
We all sang songs of Hosanna, praising the name of Jesus when the kids came in. Now it's time to share the name of Jesus. Not just talk about it, but to be the child of God that he wants us to be. So these altars are going to be open. I just ask you to put one person's name on your heart and ask God to give you a divine moment of time to invite that person to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Whether it's personally or whether it's an invite to church, we have a job to do. We cannot be lethargic. We cannot sit on our sideline. We have to get involved in the game. And the game is the game of life. And the eternal destination is heaven. But can I tell you the opposite of that? The eternal destination of your friend, the eternal destination of somebody that you have a heart for, if you do not do your job, that eternal destination is hell. Wow. Do you love? Do you want that person to experience what God has given to you? Because what we are saying is life is important. And the invite this week is important. And this prayer is is important. Would you please stand to your feet and let us make changes to our life. Let us invite those people that need Jesus within our life. As we sing this song, let's pray for that person. Let's pray for our life. Let's make sure God is doing what God wants us to do within our life. Let us sing this song.